Good morning, I'm Bill Hubert, Chief Economist at Trade.com, and welcome to our weekly financial markets review here on Core Finance. Now, my guest this morning is Stephen Pope, Managing Director at Spotlight Group. Now, Stephen, let's first of all talk about last night's FOMC meeting before we talk about another Trump bump. Right. Certainly the minutes have come through, and it's indicating that the Fed is somewhat divided. Now, I know we have said that really the talking heads one should listen to <laughs> are the chair, and then the president of the New York Fed. That's William Dudley. That's right. Now, before the minutes came through, we had Mr. Dudley suggesting that he's fully confident there's going to be the prescribed sequence of rate increases. And after his year. talk earlier this week, Fed fund features implying 46 probability yes. that we would get the rate hike on the 13th of December. That's right. So he's generally suggesting we're going to have that rate hike. The futures seem to be hedging their bets very much so if it's 46.54 that uh, it will happen. Then through the minutes, you start seeing that uh, from Cleveland, you're having uh, Loretta Meister suggesting that the Fed really needs to be watching the data but being proactive. Well, if they've not been proactive, we wonder what have they been doing. <laughs> well, and it doesn't say much for other central banks. So one hopes that they've been proactive. And uh, I would generally expect that the Fed are keeping a very close eye. And whilst inflation is going to make the 2% target, but it's not happening in the near-term future, then they are right to be cautious and perhaps affect any tightening of policy through the thinning down of the balance sheet. Because as you said, in the June minutes, it showed that two Fed governors were concerned about inflation, not at 2%. Last night, it just said several market feelings. And also, I got a number of reports both last night and a couple of people commenting on financial television last night and then this morning talking about comparing the Fed's concept, whether it be the European Central Bank, the Bank of England, to the Phillips curve. Now, for some of our viewers who may not know this, okay, the Phillips curve was invented by a man named William Phillips, who was a New Zealander economist in 1958. Let me repeat that, 1958. This was after he had done a major treatise on UK wage and price pressures from the years 1821 to 1957. So these people, and I have to agree with that, and okay, I was on a conference, both the MENA conference in 2010 and 2011, my thoughts on the Phillips curve. Even then, I said, in those days, it was outdated. And just to look at the Phillips curve, okay, the simple fact in 1958, there were 27 developed countries, okay? Now they're like 200. Oh, some of those emerging markets, less developed, maybe you've heard of them. Uh, China, India, Vietnam, the Philippines, most of uh, Southeast Asia. So the whole point, my feeling is, this is something that has no correlation to what we're looking at now with over 250 countries that are developing markets. And I think we see this, and, and again, when we talk about when we get into oil, I mean, what OPEC has done in the past six months, had they done this on limited oil before fracking, shale oil, we would have seen oil at 150 to 175 rather than struggling at 50, 55 dollars. Would you agree? I agree. So let's just go back and think about the Phillips yes. curve. So here we have a concept that's just around about 60 years old based <laughs> upon data from before that. So the theoretical concept is probably interesting as an economics education tool, but to try and apply it directly to the world we have today is wrong. It might be a useful footnote. I think what you're finding is that people lean and reach for old pieces of <laughs> theory when they're almost bereft of ideas as to the current contemporary scenario. I mean, is this something we learned at uni 50 years ago? And, and yeah. one of the few things we can remember? <laughs> yes, yes, along with the <laughs> NV equals PT. Yeah. But generally speaking, <laughs> I think that, uh, yes, it has an interesting ring to it. And uh, it has a sort of tautological sense. However, I think that with so many ways we can have money now and so many different ways that people obtain their livelihood through different forms of work, it actually to try and relink this uh, wage inflation and uh, actual price growth of the economy is going down the wrong track. We need more sophisticated tools and that's why we now use greatly complex econometric models as against leaning on 60-year-old concepts and theories. Well, you just mentioned the word like medium of exchange. Now, let's look at gold first. And we'll use this as a, as a preface of something we may talk about later. It's the B word. Oh, <laughs> so, the B word, yes. So let's look at gold. Your thoughts here, midterm, long term? 
Well, I think we've mentioned before that this line we have here at 1300 seems to have proven itself as a very strong resistance point to gold. Uh, we had a little flirtation above it back in November of 16, but then if you look here around March, May, April of uh, this year, it's held steady. You take it again in June, it's held, and it's held at this current time. The reason why gold has had a bit of a <coughs> lift overnight is because of the ambiguity coming through from the Fed minutes. But we have had ambiguous minutes before, yes. and gold has popped up. Yes. People will jump in and take profits because many traders are aware of that resistance line there, and they will be cautious sellers as we tend towards 1300. And it's so a downturn because, will be coming. You know, most everybody has said that the move up at above towards 1300 was basically more Trump related rather than economy related? Well, to an extent, there was some Trump idea, and maybe there was the hope that he was going to create this great, robust and vigorous recovery, <laughs> and that would lead to good inflation. I think part of the recent jump up ahead of the overnight move was the tensions between the United States and North Korea. Now, that's beginning yes. to dial back a little, and so gold has had this slight turn down once more. But overall, I think you're just seeing another cyclical play in the price of this metal, and the only way it's going to break out of that almost parallel line that runs between around 12, 10, 1300 is if some calamity that's an exogenous effect we can't predict at the current time actually occurs. Well, now let's look at, look at oil, okay? I mean, because this is one of the things where we saw 73, 74, 79 mm -hmm. with the squeeze by OPEC and, and oil just went up and up and up. Well, as we see right now, Brent struggling at 50, WTI is struggling at like 48. Uh, is this fracking shale oil or is it just the simple fact is is that it's just it's not going to the moon well we talked before and mentioned that oil has been sort of pushed between a rock and a hard place of opec cuts and uh, fracking production i think there's a third dimension that's coming in a bit more thinking now so you have opec trying to cap production and hold the prices higher that's been negated by the fact that we've had this fracking, the rigs have come on, and they've allowed more production to come through. But also we're looking at what's happening with the reserves. It could well be at the current time that in two months from now, we'll have US reserves below their five-year rolling average. Now that could be a concern. However, if you would say yeah, but, but that's going to push prices but up. But the time you're talking about will be the end of the driving season in Indeed. the States, okay? Yeah, so yes. that's usually a pivotal point after we get to the 1st of September. That's right. And, and now let's look at the next chart, which, of course, you know, the Baker Hughes. I mean, this is the one that really is, is putting the kibosh <laughs> on $100, $125, $150 oil. That's right. I think we've seen the chart before. We're not showing it today because it's just become a sort of a plateau yes. at the current level. And what you've seen is that around sort of the, the 7 20 730 or so rig count, we've actually seen to get very minor changes week by week now. And that is shown here in this percentage change. Uh, the yellow line there is representing flat, no change at all. And look how we are just dancing around that at the current time. So the days of massive gains of 20 or 30 rigs per week, I think that's gone past now. And that comes back to something else we discussed before, that we've reached almost economic optimum Either the scale and the number of plants is at its sort of most uh, critical point at the current time. Well, There's no need for more. Now that we've got all our viewers salivating, as we've talking about medium of exchange, we've talked about gold, shall we dive in and say, what do we think about Bitcoin? Oh, Bitcoin, yes. Now, so Bitcoin is one of these wonderful cryptocurrencies. It has the benefit of being the first mover, so it has first mover advantage. It was also the first one that was actually traded through a recognized exchange. Uh, look at this chart. Now, <laughs> what we've had is that from its very humble beginnings, where you would probably have to use about two or three bitcoins to buy a dollar, we're now at a situation where, well, it's just gone crazy. It's running around 4000 or so dollars to the bitcoin. And what we're looking at is that there has been this big expansion of how one acquires it through mining. It used to be sit back on your home computer, and you could run it through the central processing unit. <clears throat> then, of course, the graphic processing unit would seem to be more powerful, but, of course, would overheat and damage one's laptop or, <laughs> or mainframe. So you now have to have powerful mining devices bolted onto the computer, and even that alone, you've probably got to work in a pool of people mining together to solve the math problems, to buy the block and buy the coins. Uh, high electricity usage. So for the people at home, it's probably not viable to say, I'm going to become a Bitcoin <laughs> miner because it will cost you more electricity and computing power. I think this is very learn. important that people need to understand it, it is your, inter your internal cost 
of trying to do a transaction. Mm. That's what you're right. The internal cost is prohibitive because it's more than the reward one's going to yes. gain from this, unless you're in a very sophisticated team of players. Now, the reason why there's been this sudden pop-up from around the, the 2,000, 3,000 mark to suddenly accelerating away is because there is very limited capacity at the current time to process transactions in Bitcoin. Uh, the pipeline is full. Now, I mean, again, the statistics, it shows you can do seven transactions per second. Well, compare that with Visa credit card. They do 2,500 a second. Right. And, and again, was this maybe one of the reasons why back on the first of this month we had the split? I think there's been the split because there's a lot of people unhappy in that you have this rigid fixed supply of Bitcoins. There's going to be no more. And, they, uh, and that's what, 21? 21 million. Okay. Now, people are saying, well, as it is, it was a pure currency bereft of any interference from outside forces. But people want more activity. We're a greedy, hungry <laughs> society. And so there's been announced in August this new platform to expand dramatically the clearing volume. So we'll go beyond the seven. Maybe we'll be up at 21 per second or so. But it will be <clears throat> far better. But there's a split saying that's breaking the purity of what Bitcoin was all about. But SegWit's 2X, as it is called, segregated <laughs> witness to the yes. chain, that's going to come online 30 days since last weekend when it was agreed and announced. So in November, this new clearance medium will come online. Now, the worry is we've already had a split between Bitcoin itself and Bitcoin Cash. The Bitcoin Cash is like a, a, a NAT compared to the other <laughs> thing in this regard. And then come November, there is a risk of a further split. Now, if that starts creating some sense of confusion to the uninitiated, it might be that people who start joining in this game start to feel, well, which one do I get? That could possibly play into the hands of the alternate cryptocurrencies that have been getting some favor. But I do know one or two of the names there. They're not getting anywhere like the Google hit traffic that Bitcoin's yes, been exactly. having. And you just said it. I mean, the correlation between Google hits and Bitcoin is astronomical. But one of the things I want to say, and maybe this is just an age thing, and I, unfortunately I belong to this. I was just watching one of the other financial news channels last week, okay, Howard Oaks, who I've known for years, okay, who's the chairman of Oak Tree, which is, which is a hedge fund. And they were talking to him about what his thoughts were. He said, well, you know, maybe I'm too old for this. I really sort of don't understand it. And he, he was comparing Bitcoin with that slight problem with the tulips in 1671. Mm -hmm. The South Sea bubble of 1720, the dot-com bubble of 1998, and then, of course, the subprime bubble of 2008. And even recently, I know that both Goldman Sachs and Wells Fargo have, sit, have published sort of uh, understanding cryptocurrencies, and yet we had, excuse me, a guy from Morgan Stanley, who I won't name, was, all, again, one of these channels. This was about, you know, when, when Bitcoin was around mm -hmm. this area, said, this is the prime poster child for speculation. <laughs> it, it certainly is that. And I, I know there's a lot of people saying that don't worry if you missed out when it was only around 1,800. Right. This is going up and it could extend to 6,000. And that is certainly a figure on a Fibonacci yes. extension yes. we would look at now. However, uh, there's two ways of looking at it. Either this is becoming a whole overblown story, because particularly when the man in the street starts seriously thinking about, I want part of this Bitcoin story, maybe then it's too late and people will clear out of this. Well, situation. let's look at it in the next shot just to see. Again, we're talking about the two previous weekends, OK? Mm. Look at the movement on the weekend, which you don't see that the Dow doesn't trade on the weekend, foreign exchange doesn't trade on the weekend, no. bonds don't trade on the weekend, but whoa, here we go, Bitcoin. Yes, indeed. And if you were to actually take out those weekends, you would see that there was this gap higher over the weekend of the 5th and the 6th. Yes, exactly That's right. incredible. And this is because it's one of those areas that you have online exchanges, and so one can keep plowing your work through, uh, have the, the Bitcoin mining modems that you stick onto the computers, cracking the mathematical problems, <laughs> which is the way one gets paid, and they can keep chugging all weekend through. But really, when you consider uh, the, how that has traded compared to a reliable, tangible asset such as gold, then one begins to wonder, well, what I, is I this think all let's about? Put the, as you say, let's put this in context, okay? The BIS estimates that $5.6 trillion is traded in the foreign exchange market. That's the OTC market. Now, again, let's put this in comparison to the bond market. The bond market probably trades a minimum of 100 to 125 
times that. That's with bonds, global bonds, and the repo market. So it's quite interesting. And, and as I say, I, I, I've talked to a number of people, okay, in the last week or 10 days now that this has exploded. And, you know, they're, they're true brokers. The market could go up and the market could go down. But one valid point, which I thought was quite right, as they said, some major, not the SEC, not Fidelity Investments, but some major financial institution, whether it be the Treasury, the Bank of England, the Bank of Japan, Back for International Settlements, the IMF, one of those at some juncture is going to have to identify one which they will, quote, legitimize. The feeling being is whether that is anywhere from Bitcoin to Ethereum, and I'm not going to make any comments, would basically would say that that would put a death knell if you're in the wrong currency. Yes. At the moment, you'd have to probably favor Bitcoin. Yes. The only fly in the ointment is the fact you have this potential third split going through. But all in all, I would say that Bitcoin would be the one that's in pole position. In Japan, they've now recognized it, and it can be used for various transactions. It's got still state approval in that regard. <clears throat> but if you were to have maybe a people to recognize it, I wouldn't be surprised if it was the Bank of Japan. Of all the major central yes. banks that would come to and It seems to be it. far more popular, if there's such a word, mm -hmm. in Asia. Yes, that's right. Well, they certainly seem to have latched onto this yes. concept very quickly. And I think what you've got to look at is that an interesting observation I heard in the week is that it's not just what is its utility value, I, what do I think I can gain by using it to buy purchases and physical goods, but it's also the networking value. Now, yes. part of that was yes. shown in those, those weekend block trades that we had, yes, a exactly. lot of activity, and the more and more sort of savvy yeah. people and the, the younger generation, tech-wise people, get into accepting it. Then because you are you part see, of a big network. you can network. go on Google on Saturday and Sunday, okay? Mm. Yeah, you, you, can't, you can't contact some of the major financial institutions because they're all on holiday. <laughs> yeah. well, that's right. And one thing that if people want to use this as a tool of speculation, and we have to stress that this is very speculative. And so buyer beware. What you can do is there might be some breaking news over the weekend. Now, if you want yes. to see, uh, say you want to go and buy gold, but markets are closed. You've got to wait for the opening yes. bell in Asia on Monday, but by that time it's gapped higher. Yes. Whereas with the Bitcoin, you can maybe be reacting to it. But of course, how do you get involved? You've got to be very cautious as to what you're doing. Then also people start talking about the various funds. i have talked about a fund manager might start running some uh, instruments, some exchange traded funds in this. There's also talk of um, baskets of cryptocurrencies. Now, what would happen there if half of them <laughs> just failed to yeah. exist? So there are many issues yet to be answered. But well, if I had to pick one, I would go can. with the Bitcoin. Let's end it on that. As you just said, there are many issues, and we would appreciate any and all comments you have, especially from you millennials who seem to understand this better than we are. Because, as I say, this is just the beginning. I have a feeling we, we're going to have more than enough opportunity, mm -hmm. Stephen, to talk about this in the days, the months, and the years to come. So thank you very much for joining us, and thank you very much, and we will see you next week.